Uh, last week, we looked at uh, the supremacy of Christ as we're continuing the series in the book of Colossians. And uh, we were especially focusing in on his greatness, his supremacy as seen in creation, especially. And not only did he create everything that has been made, everything has been made, it says, by him and for him. And he holds it all together. Like Jesus, the one who we sing about, is the one who spoke everything into creation, and he is the one who holds it together. It's an amazing thought. And sort of with that thought in mind, last week I spoke about if Jesus could hold the universe together, he could certainly hold our lives together. If Jesus is supreme, which he is, we could trust him. And that's so important. Earlier uh, this week, as many of you received the uh, email uh, announcements and things like that, uh, we sent out a prayer uh, announcement uh, regarding Nathan Wu, who is uh, Jeremy and Ophelia's three-month-old son. And it was discovered he was having some seizures, and um, they had to uh, do an emergency operation on his brain. Uh, there was a tumor there. And uh, we were at the hospital at Harborview, and there was a group of us that were there um, just praying and uh, uplifting up little Nathan and Jeremy and Ophelia. And um, what transpired was really cool. I mean, uh, the surgery went well, and we're just so thankful for that. Um, during the prayer time, I noticed how... <clears throat> Those who are praying, they were speaking of God's sovereignty. They were speaking of how this little baby who's so precious, this three-month-old, is in the Father's hands. And there's a great comfort in that when we re recognize that we're in our Father's hands. That same evening, a group of us went to go pray uh, for Doris's brother, who has ALS. And um, we were there to pray for him. And as was pointed out, there's, no one has been healed from ALS. That's we know of. And yet we prayed anyway. Um, we were there to minister, and in the midst of trying to minister, uh, personally, I got ministered to. Because... This man who's, um, you know, he has pretty young children. He has an incredible faith. He's lost his ability to walk. So he's in a wheelchair. And he speaks of God. And he speaks of God being sovereign. And he speaks of him, how much he still loves him. And it's perplexing to know why he would be struck with this condition when he has so much life to live. And yet, to see his faith and to see his eternal perspective is just ministered to me, and I believe it ministered to others who were there to pray with him and for him. See, life happens. You know, that same night, I was on a Skype prayer session with um, William and Susanna. And as we know, they're in uh, Hong Kong and uh, they're in the middle of, you know, all that's going on over there. And we had a chance to pray and they were telling me, you know, that right now over there, uh, there's a lot of restrictions in terms of gatherings, and they've, you can't gather anymore in groups larger than five people because of the fear of the spread of the coronavirus. And so we were praying about that situation, and it's just so comforting to know that though the world seems like it's falling apart, that there's so many things happening in this world things that we feel are out of our control. 
that we know that we have and serve and live with a God who holds the whole world in his hands. In the midst of heartache, in the midst of anguish, in the midst of uncertainty, remembering that God holds us is an amazing source of comfort because if we have a, a, a view of God where well, we see him as he rightly is, there's great comfort in that, but if we have a diminished view of God, if our God is small and impotent, if our God is frail, then we will live in that sort of reality that we've created for ourselves, and there's no peace in that. Because now it falls on us and our shoulders to manage life. But seeing God and knowing that he is truly supreme, it leads to this deep and abiding peace. And so that was last week. This whole idea that we could have peace, that we could have peace in God. But this week we're going to shift the focus to a different sort of peace. It's not so much a peace in God because Jesus is an awesome creator and the sustainer of the universe. We're going to be looking at peace with God because Jesus is our reconciling Savior. It's going to uh, be from Colossians 1, 19 through 23. It's just a very short passage we're going to look at. I'm going to ask us to stand as we read it, and hopefully we'll be encouraged as we read God's word. So let's go ahead and stand as we read God's word. This is what Colossians 1, 19 to 23 says. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Lord, would you bless your word today. May you compel us, Lord, as we listen to the preached word to be responsive in our hearts, God, I pray that we would glean from your word all that you would have for us, and we trust that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish its very purpose in which you wrote it. And so we thank you, God. We pray your blessing on us. Give us ears that hear and hearts that respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. It wasn't too long after we started Cornerstone where there was a young man who started to come to our church and he had moved here from out of state. And uh, he was working in a job, uh, and, but his heart was to go into ministry and he had gone to seminary and he started to come to our, our church. And um, somewhere along the, lane, along the way, I discovered I had offended him. Uh, I don't know what I did, uh, but I knew I'd offended him because he asked one of the other leaders to... to bring us together so that we might reconcile. Have you ever had that experience where you didn't know you did something, and, but someone had a problem with you? You were kind of taken off guard. You were like, oh, I didn't realize. Maybe you said something you shouldn't have said. Maybe you didn't do something that you said you were going to do. But somewhere along the line, you had offended somebody, and you were... It was, you were uh, Bewildered by it, you didn't realize what you had done. Would it surprise you if I told you that that's the state of every single one of us before coming to Christ? That you may not have realized it, but there was a rift between you and God. There was something, an offense that you had uh, done against God. That there was this separation between you and God. You might think, wow, what did I do? What did I do? 
That's what the scripture tells us. Every person was an enemy of God. But through faith in Christ, we can have peace with God. That's what this passage is telling us. Look at verses 19 to 22. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, and me, and you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. In other words, he's brought together in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. See, this verse is telling us we were alienated from God. We were even, what it says, we were hostile toward him. Hostile. We didn't want to do his will. We wanted to do our own will. Before coming to Christ, we ignored him. We, we lived as if he didn't matter. But it goes on to say that through the blood, the shed blood of Christ on the cross, we now have peace with God. It's not the peace of God. It's peace with God. It's a relational peace that comes when we are reconciled to God. And through Christ, we are brought back into relationship with God. So The question is, well, wait a minute now. Does that mean that we had a relationship and then we're separated and now he's bringing us back? No, it means that when we are reconciled to God, that means that we are now reconciled to the very purpose in which he created us. He created us to be in relationship with him, but because of our sin, we were separated from him and now we're brought back into our intended purpose and that is to be in a relationship with him. With God. This passage says something that is mind boggling that He's done something not only for us, but He's done something in us and to us. We were once alienated and hostile, it says in verse 21. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling like, really? Was my sin really that bad? But you're looking at your sin compared to other people. What we need to see is our sin relative to a holy and pure God. And we understand that he is pure holiness and pure righteousness. Then, as the scripture says, our righteous deeds look like filthy rags. This is what it means to be alienated from a God that is holy and pure. There's a story of a man named uh, Antonis uh, Mavropoulos. You don't know the name. Um, But uh, he's a Greek man. And um, he missed his flight one day. He missed his flight. He was very irritated. Two minutes. He was, he was late, and um, he, he, he needed to go to um, a conference. And he was late getting to the gate, and they shut the gate, and he was there, and he was two minutes, and he could see the people aboarding. He says, hey, can I get on that plane? I want to get on that plane. And they said, no, you're too late. That flight was the Ethiopian flight 302. It's the flight that crashed and killed 157 people on that last year. And you can imagine what he thought when he discovered that the flight he was supposed to be on, the flight he missed by two minutes, was the very flight that went down and killed every single passenger on that flight. You know, many of us, we heard of the accident, but it didn't 
it didn't impact us. You know what I mean? We felt the moment of sadness and grief, but there was nothing in that that necessarily changed the way we went about our life. But for this man, there was this sudden realization that he was so close to being on that flight, and it was only because he was delayed and late by two minutes that he was not on that flight, and his life was spared. And he said that he feels compelled now in a way of sort of honoring those other 157 passengers and crew members that he wants to, he feels like he needs to uh, figure out what happened on that flight. Why did that plane go down? I mean, he's making it his life mission almost to figure this thing out. He's not a believer, but it changed him. It changed him. I wonder for how many of us, when we recognize we were actually enemies of God, and we were on a pathway to eternal separation from him. And I wonder if that captures us to such a degree that it would actually change the way we do life. It would actually change the way we go about things, and it would change the way the things that we value the things that we spend our time with, that that would be such an uh, uh, earth-shattering thing that happens to us when we realize I was an enemy of God. I was hostile to him. I was without God and without hope in this world, and then he rescued me. And someone shared the gospel with me. And now I'm in a right relationship with him. And that changes everything. See, some of us have the advantage of being born into a family of faith. And you may think that because you were born into a family of faith, that there wasn't this time where you could really remember when you received the Lord Jesus. Jesus has always been around, and yet we know that no one is born into God's family. You need to be reborn into God's family. But I know for myself, growing up, because my parents were believers, and they brought me to Sunday school, they brought me to, to a church and things like that, that um, I can't remember a time when I didn't believe that God was there are certain markers in my life where I remember saying, yes, I want to make a commitment to him now. But for some of us, I think that if you grew up in a Christian home, you may kind of take for granted in some respects all that God has done for you. That even though you were in a Christian home, that you were at that time still alienated from God. That you and your heart were hostile to him. And that you were on a path toward destruction. And yet God, somehow, someway, he used someone in your life to bring the message of hope. The message of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing that God does for us through the gospel and through the cross of Christ. It says here that he makes us holy. It's, that's the second point of this message. Every Christian is holy, blameless, and above reproach. Wow. When we speak of God forgiving us, he does even more than that. He forgives us, but he also makes us something. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. I'm going to ask you to do something kind of uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me these truths. I'm going to say, I am holy, and I want you to say, I'm holy. 
I'm blameless. I'm blameless. And I'm above reproach. All right? I am holy. I am blameless. I am above reproach. That is uncomfortable, right? And some of you may be thinking, I could say the words, I don't know if I feel it in my heart. And the reason why you feel this maybe disconnect with those words is because you're all too aware of your own sinful actions and thoughts. See, because even this morning coming here, you probably sinned a dozen times, right? And if you're not convinced of that, ask your spouse. And you can just feel that, that, you know what? I'm so aware of my own shortcoming. It's hard for me to embrace this truth that I am holy, that I am blameless, that I am above reproach. It's, it's this amazing thought that how do we go about convincing ourselves of these things that God speaks of in his word? It may cause us to wonder, doesn't God see us? Doesn't God see our sin? Doesn't he see what we so plainly see? See, the problem isn't that God can't see what we see. The problem is that we can't see what he sees. That we can't see what God sees. And we can't believe what God has declared. And yet his word says, this is what he's done for you. This is what he's done to you. I've made you holy and blameless and above reproach so that you could stand in the presence of God. The only way you could stand in the presence of God, a holy God, a righteous God, is because he has made you holy and righteous and blameless and above reproach. If God says that we are holy and blameless and above reproach, then we should take him at his word. Living out of our true identity is a major key to living a victorious Christian life. We do a lot of teaching on this, especially in Freedom in Christ, because we come back to it over and over and over again. And I could almost guarantee you, when people are struggling with something, when there are emotional problems, maybe there's depression, maybe there's anxiety and worry and stress and all that stuff, you could usually go back to a deficient view or understanding of your identity in Christ. Because you're seeing yourself not based on God's truth and what he has declared, you're seeing yourself based on your actions. And you're defining yourself based on your actions. And so it becomes this cycle of if I define myself by what I see and what, what I see is sin, that means I am a sinner. But if I see truly who God has made me to be through Christ, that he has made me holy and righteous and, and above reproach, I will begin to live this way because that's who I truly am. It's one of the important keys to life. And you got to go back to it over and over and over again. That God has done this to you. And his word is truth. And when we live according to the truth, we begin to live differently. But if we live according to the lie, that too has consequences. Some of us live out of a false narrative of our lives. These, these deceptive lies are what the enemy wants us to live out of that keep us in bondage. Let me give you an example. One common false identity is living out of what we call a victim's mentality. This, is, uh, this one is uh, really difficult because there are real victims. There are legitimate instances when people are a victim. Uh, 
It could be a, a racial uh, prejudice against you. It could be sexism. It could be uh, from being in an abusive relationship. Um, when you've been subject to that, you are a victim. There's no doubt about it. And yet, there's a difference between being a victim and having a victim's mentality. It can make it difficult to make that distinction sometimes, and yet it means the difference between someone who's going to live in defeat, to live in anger, to live with the sense that everyone's out to get me, to live when people um, uh, live in such a way that they have to do, they, they're so worried about everything going wrong and because they're a victim that they have to control everything. Maybe they resign themselves because they were a victim. They've convinced themselves that nothing ever goes right for them. And so they just stop trying. Maybe they refuse to trust people because people just can't be trusted. You could see just how being a victim could lead you down this pathway of a victim's mentality that leads you then to a whole life of worry, of, of, of uh, anxiety, of fear. That's what happens when we don't understand our identity in Christ. We don't understand, no, 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 we are holy we are blank, we are above reproach. We are beloved. All those things that come with being in a right relationship with God and what He has done to us. Some people live out of this false identity that their worth is based on what they do. So that leads to this performance mentality. I have to outperform everybody else. I have to measure myself of how I stack up against others. I have to, uh, I have my, you know, little secret celebrations when someone else falters because it makes me look better. Sometimes we Christianize things and, you know, we, we sort of, uh, in, even in our Christian life, we substitute spending time with God just relating to him and that becomes secondary to, oh, I have to, I have to serve God. God, and I have to do all these things for God, and we forget and neglect just to be in relationship with him. It's so important that we are really keyed in and tied in to our identity, what he has done to us. And then thirdly, out of this passage, this truth, the gospel is our source of security. The gospel is our source of security. It says, If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This um, is interesting, this passage, because it speaks of all these things that come to us that God does for us, and it says this, if you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, this perseverance, this clinging to the gospel. And throughout scriptures, the Bible, the authors of the Bible, they, they, they compel us to stay true to the gospel. Don't move away from the gospel. We see this in John 15, 5 through 6. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. There's an agricultural picture of these painting there. You gotta abide, you gotta stay true, you gotta stay with Christ. You cannot leave, there's no hope if you leave Christ. 
Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Stern warning. A warning that says, don't leave Christ. Second Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. God is warning his people. Take him seriously. Don't forsake Jesus. Jesus is the one who saves There is no salvation apart from Christ. Don't move away from him. Continue, abide in him. Paul says he became a minister of this gospel. Paul's life was just transformed. Paul came into this understanding. He he encountered the risen Christ, and his life just took a very dramatic turn after that. And he became a minister of the gospel. You don't need to have a Damascus Road experience in order to be a minister of the gospel. You may think that, well, Paul became a minister because he had this amazing, miraculous encounter with Christ. Every encounter with Christ is a miracle. It doesn't matter if you met him in a Sunday school class. It doesn't matter if your parents spoke of Christ to you while you were just a little girl, little boy. It doesn't matter if you were sitting in a bar and someone came up to you and shared Jesus with you. If you came into faith with him, it was a miracle. God touched your life. And as Paul made that decision, to become a minister of the gospel, that's what every single one of us should be be doing as well. That we should see ourselves as a minister of the gospel wherever God has called us to be. Our Oaxaca team was sending out uh, updates about what was happening there. And it was so thrilling to read about their encounters with people. They were bringing food buckets to homes and then engaging people in conversations. And then they were sharing the gospel. Uh, They were praying for people and uh, people were accepting the Lord. It was just amazing. Um, And it just struck me how awesome it is to uh, to own the feet that bring the good news to people. That these folks were going out there and just being bold for the Lord, and just speaking of Jesus. Just speaking of Jesus. Because he is the way. He's the truth and the life. This last uh, Thursday, there were nine folks who came out for Alpha. And it's so cool because, you know, people are just inviting people just to come and, and consider, who is Jesus? Who is he? What did he do? And it's just a safe place for people to consider who Jesus is. It's so cool. You know, um, I've been um, playing on this pool team, and I invited every one of them to come out to Alpha, and none of them did. In fact, none of them even responded to my email invitation. They didn't even acknowledge the fact that I had invited them. 
It doesn't matter. I still want to continue. I mean, it matters in the long run. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I care, right? What, what I'm talking about, it doesn't matter. I don't want to give up. I don't want to stop inviting. I don't want to stop telling people because Jesus is the only way for people to experience eternal life. Jesus is the way. There is only one plan A and there is no plan B. And people need to hear this message of the great news of what God has done for them. And you may be here today and maybe you're here because someone invited you. Maybe you're here, but you've never made a personal faith commitment to Jesus, and I want to just invite you to do so. Yesterday, I was reminded that we live as Christians, oftentimes, without a sense of urgency. In other words, we just go through our days and weeks and months and years, and there's no sense of urgency. And so, you know, there's people all around us that really are literally on their way to an eternal separation from God. And the way we live our lives would indicate we really don't care that much. Or we live our lives in a way that says, you know what? Um, someday... Someday I will share with them. Someday I will invite them. Someday, but we just keep putting that off and putting that off and putting that off. And what I was reminded of yesterday um, was in the, in the Gospels or in the, in, the, in the Bible, when the word went out, there was a sense of urgency. There was a sense of decision. There was a sense of, hey, Give people this opportunity to make a decision. Ask them, would you like to receive Christ? There have been times when I've spoken to people and I've shared the gospel with them and I've said, would you like to receive Christ? And they said, no. And literally, two minutes later, I ask them again and they say, yes. It's an amazing thing. It's like their first reaction was no, and then I've asked them two minutes later, would you like to receive Christ? Yes. I don't know what happened in those two minutes. But God did something, and he touched their heart, and maybe their first response was just a, hey, I need some time to think about it, but yet they realized, wait, I think I am ready. And I've left those encounters thinking, what if I didn't ask? What if, I, what if I didn't ask again? But there's, there's something about having this sense of urgency that says, hey, let's be bold and just share. And I have a lot of confidence in our church family in that we have a lot of loving people in our church. And I know the way you're going to share isn't going to be, you know, belligerent and manipulative is just just sharing what God has done for you, what he's done for them in a very natural way, but then bring them to that point of would you like to receive Christ? Because there's no other way. And if we neglect so great a salvation, and if we could turn our face to the Son of God, for what he's done for us and say, no, thank you. If people reject the Lord, there's no other plan for them. That's the only hope. He is the hope of the world. And it's our privilege and even our responsibility to let people know what we know. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. As we consider the fact that we were enemies of God at one time, and we were separated from him, and yet because of somebody's boldness, 
someone's courage, maybe someone's persistency, they shared the gospel with us and we accepted it. We invited Christ into our life. We embraced his truth and it's changed our lives. And I would just encourage you, be that person for somebody else. Be that one who is persistent. Be that one who's going to continue to share no matter what. I'm going to uh, invite us to stand right now. If you'd like to receive the Lord, during the worship time, you could just say the simple prayer, Bless Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I receive your salvation. I place my faith and trust in Christ. It's not the exact wording that matters. It's the heart condition that you are trusting in Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you'd like to do that, please do so. If you'd like someone to pray with you, we're going to have our intercessors on the side, and we'd love to pray with you. Um, whether or not you, have, you want to pray a prayer of salvation, you may have other needs. And so if you have other needs as well, please feel free to come up and receive prayer. I think I mentioned uh, at our last prayer training, we had a number of people who had some physical things and we prayed for them and they were healed. God touched them and he healed them. So if you have something going on that way too, please uh, feel free to come up and receive prayer. We have offering boxes if you'd like to give offering as a response in your worship. Let's, uh, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Jesus, for sending him, and that he has made us holy, holy and blameless and above reproach. I thank you, Lord. I pray that we would continue to learn and walk in the reality of what you have done for us, God. God, I pray that we would be people who are so keyed into this amazing truth that you have saved us, that you have delivered us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. And that light is the light of love. And so pour your love into our hearts so that we might love others all around us, and that we might love them, especially by sharing the great news of what Jesus wants to do for them and to them. Lord, I pray for courage and strength for our church family. It's so cool just to see people going out. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that you've made a difference through our church family in Oaxaca, in Japan, in Southeast Asia. And Lord, we want that same thing to be happening here in Bellevue, in Issaquah, in Redmond, all around Seattle, Lord that we would be your people bringing the great news of Jesus. Thank you, God. We worship you now in your name. Amen.